So welcome. I'm Professor Ben McChunkin. I'm an associate professor of law at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law here at Arizona State University. Uh, I teach and write about the criminalization and policing of marginalized communities uh, with particular emphasis on gender, sexuality, and homelessness. And most relevant today, I'm also the Associate Deputy Director for the Academy for Justice. For those of you who aren't yet familiar, the Academy for Justice is a diverse team of reform-minded scholars and experts from a number of different institutions who believe that knowledge is the most important tool we have for addressing the array of problems confronting the American criminal justice system. We come from different backgrounds and each of us brings different perspectives, experiences, and methodologies to bear on our criminal justice reform work. As a scholarly collective, our approach to criminal justice reform is interdisciplinary, pragmatic, and nonpartisan. And our shared mission is to bridge the gap between academic ideas and on the ground criminal justice reform by making scholarly research and ideas accessible to policymakers, stakeholders, journalists, and the public. So on behalf of the Academy for Justice, I could not be more delighted to bring you today's lecture, Police Violence in America, Obvious Problem, Obvious Solution by Mr. Roy L. Austin, Jr. Uh, Mr. Austin is currently a partner at Harris, Wiltshire, and Granis in Washington, D.C., and he serves as a board member for the Council on Criminal Justice. He also has an exemplary record of public service. He started his career at the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, where he was a trial attorney investigating and prosecuting hate crimes and police brutality. He was eventually appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General. He later joined the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office as a sex crimes, homicide, and public correction prosecutor and as the Human Trafficking Task Force Coordinator. Mr. Austin then joined the Obama White House as Deputy Assistant to the President for the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice, and Opportunity, where he led policy efforts concerning criminal justice reform, civil rights, and human services. And he served on the My Brother's Keepers Task Force. So quite a distinguished career. We're thrilled to have him as our guest today. Uh, so following Mr. Austin's lecture is going to be a response by Frank Rudy Cooper, Professor Cooper is a William S. Boyd Professor of Law and the Director of the Program on Race, Gender, and Policing at the UNLV William S. Boyd School of Law. He teaches and writes on the intersection of criminal procedure, police with race and gender, and he's associated with the Academy for Justice as a consultant on police civilian review boards. Following Professor Cooper's response to Mr. Austin, we'll end today's webinar with a conversation between Mr. Austin, Professor Cooper, and myself using questions that you all have submitted in advance. And I will note that it is not too late to submit questions. If you think of a question you want answered during the lecture uh, or during the response, please email it to academyforjustice at asu.edu, and I'll do my best to make sure it gets answered. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Roy L. Austin to get us started. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I'm excited to see what today's webinar has in store. Mr. Austin. Ben, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for allowing me to participate with, uh, with you today. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen here and we will get started. So I, I wanna start off just by saying again, thank you very much for, for joining us here today. And let me start by telling you what I hope you take away from uh, this, this talk. First and foremost, it's not just about a few bad apples. Secondly, we do know what to do to improve policing. We've done it before and it has worked. And thirdly, our criminal justice system as it currently exists is not working. And so change is something which is absolutely something that we need. So let me start off by taking you to 1991. Now, policing in America actually goes all the way back to uh, what we did with respect to the, the slave trade uh, and uh, people enforcing slavery. It, it takes us back to what we saw with uh, Jim Crow and Reconstruction, and of course the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and policing has been uh, brutal in, in all of those, at all of those times. But I take you back to 1991, uh, really because that is the first time that we saw video as Americans uh, regarding uh, police brutality. Uh, so, As a week of pretrial motions ended today in the case of the four Los Angeles policemen already indicted in the Rodney King beating, the county grand jury signal that will be the extent of the criminal case. 17 other so-called police bystanders at the beating scene will not be indicted, a development noted with frustration by the Los Angeles County attorney whose office presented the evidence. Now, however morally wrong their failure to intercede, in California law, there is no criminal statute 
under which these officers can be indicted. The inaction of the 17 officers may now be investigated by the U.S. Attorney's Office for possible civil rights violations. But of greater concern, said the county attorney, are the results of interviews with some of the police bystanders. Now, the reason why I want to start there is, is not to talk about the four officers who, who beat Rodney King. Obviously, as we look at that today, their behavior was wrong. But what I want to talk about is the 17 officers who sat there and did absolutely nothing. Did absolutely nothing as these four officers viciously beat Rodney King. It is my opinion that those 17 officers do not deserve to be police officers. Had that been a civilian beating another civilian and they did nothing, they would have been fired. It should not make any difference that they were, in fact, police officers who were beating uh, a civilian. But let's talk about Rodney King just a little bit to put it into context. This happened in 1991. As I said, it was one of the first, vi first beatings that was really captured uh, on video. It came out, the video came out the next day. The LAPD chief at the time immediately said that these officers would be prosecuted, which is, in fact, unusual. But when they were prosecuted about a year later, they were acquitted, which led to protests and riots around the country. Eventually, the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Department of Justice stepped in to re-prosecute those officers. When they re-prosecuted the officers, two of the officers were found guilty, two were found not guilty. The 17 officers who sat there watching were never prosecuted in any way, shape, or form. And the officers who were found guilty were sentenced to 30 months uh, jail, they served 26. Now, they were prosecuted under something called 242, which is uh, a lot of words that I have up on your screen right now. But the most important ones are, first of all, under color of law, meaning that they were operating as police officers. Secondly, that they deprived someone of their constitutional rights, here the Fourth Amendment right to be free from unlawful searches and seizures. But this word willfully has been the problem with, with federal criminal uh, civil rights prosecutions for some time. And that is because it is a, a word that means that the officer at the moment that they uh, beat the person, shot the person or whatever, knew that what they were doing was wrong and decided to continue to do it anyway. We currently have legislation in the House of Representatives, the Justice and Policing Act, that changes that word willfully to knowingly or recklessly, a much lower standard. And I would argue to you that had we had that standard uh, the uh, Eric Garner case would have been prosecuted by the federal government. The Philando Castile case in Minnesota would have been prosecuted by the federal government. But this willful language has been a problem for some time. Now let's move to 1994. As a result of what happened in the Rodney King case, we had a statute, I apologize. Um, as a result of what happened in the Rodney King case, the, uh, as part of the 1994 crime bill, we had the uh, initiation of pattern or practice investigations and giving the Department of Justice authority on pattern or practice investigations. Now these are taking it a step up. So it's one thing that we, we prosecute the individual officers who are involved. And one would hope that if we prosecute individual officers, that what, res what, what comes of that is that the uh, rest of the department behaves itself. The rest of the department looks at this and says, we have to do better. But in fact, what happens is everyone points to those four officers and the 17 officers sit there and say, well, that's those four officers issue. Those are a few bad apples. We don't have to do anything to change. So this pattern of practice authority is a look at the entire police department. And again, we have the language that it is conduct by law enforcement officers that deprives people of their constitutional rights. But here it's not money damages. And this is not a, a private person getting any damages. This is equitable, equitable or declaratory relief, which means an order from the Department of Justice to change and asking a police department to change. So let's jump to New Orleans. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit between New Orleans and Los Angeles in, in this talk. In New Orleans, we had a woman here pictured named Kim Groves. Kim Groves sat there and watched two New Orleans police department officers pistol whip her nephew. And Kim Groves did exactly what we would want Kim Groves to do. And she, is, she filed an official report, official complaint with the New Orleans Police Department officer, with the New Orleans Police Department. Well, these officers learned about this complaint and one officer in particular, a person by the name of Len Davis, Len Davis 
it turned out was working with local drug dealers, was providing protection for them and getting kickbacks from them. So he called one of those local, uh, one of those local drug dealers and he asked that local drug dealer to take care of Kim Groves. And that drug dealer found Kim Groves standing on a street corner and he shot her in the face and killed her. Now, uh, Officer Davis, it turns out, was prosecuted by the uh, U.S. Department of Justice under 242, the statute that I showed you earlier, and he was convicted of that crime along with his fellow officers as well as the drug dealer. Len Davis, who happens to be a black man, uh, who was a police officer, is the first person that the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice ever put on death row, and he remains there today. But again, the, so again, we had people point to this. One of the most brutal acts by a police officer, a murder for hire, and people pointed to Len Davis and said, well, he's just a bad apple. We don't have to do anything about Len Davis. And so uh, the New Orleans De Police Department, it turns out, there were a lot of Len Davises out there. Maybe not as brutal, but still criminals, still not deserving of having the rights and the authority of being police officers. And so there was this broader investigation that was happening with the New Orleans Police Department. Over 50 police officers were investigated between 1993 and 96. Those were the ones that were arrested. And I would proffer to you that many, many more officers, probably in the hundreds, knew about the bad conduct of these 50 officers and did nothing. Now, this investigation was a huge one and it would have continued, but for the fact that the Len Davis uh, murder for hire happened and they had to shut down the investigation. And when they shut down the investigation, it, it prevented us from digging in even deeper and learning more about how bad the New Orleans Police Department was. Nonetheless, using that 14141 at the time, the Pattern or Practice Authority, an investigation was opened by the U.S. Department of Justice into the New Orleans Police Department. Again, not just a few bad apples, an entire police department that was violating people's constitutional rights. They opened a Pattern of Practice investigation, but instead of seeking a consent decree, and a consent decree is a court order requiring a department to fix itself or to, to become fixed and an independent monitor to make sure the department is following that. But instead of seeking that here in, with the New Orleans Police Department, the Department of Justice, and this is under a democratic administration, the Department of Justice said, New Orleans Police Department, go ahead and fix yourself. Go ahead and fix yourself. And we'll see how that works. Now, at the same time, following the Rodney King case, the Department of Justice started looking at the fact that, again, we have the four officers involved in the beating. People said just a few bad apples. We have the 17 officers who sat there and watched it, which I would proffer to you, those 17 should not be police officers. But we had an entire police department that was corrupt and violating people's constitutional rights. And that police department, it was primarily the gang unit that people were looking at, this crash unit, community resources against street hoodlums, not a name that I suspect that, that a, a gang unit could use now uh, though the attitude is probably still very similar. These officers were involved in murders. They were involved in perjury. They were protecting drug dealers. They were stealing drugs and money. They were arresting people falsely. So one of the officers got caught early in this and he implicated 70 different officers. And I would proffer to you again, these 70 officers, not a single one of them should probably be a police officer. But the result of that investigation was only eight convictions, three of which ended up being overturned, only five terminations, and 12 officers were suspended. If you know about corruption at this level, if you are getting money from drug dealers, if you are stealing money from civilians, you do not deserve to be a police officer. And to just suspend those officers is insufficient. So the Department of Justice did this investigation and at the time in 2000, they issued what is a five page findings letter. And I, I note that there's five pages because the findings letter defines what it is the police department was doing wrong, how they were violating people's constitutional rights. And what came out of that was a 187 page consent decree. 187 pages of these are the things that the police office has to do, the police department has to do to start behaving constitutionally. It covered everything from use of force to how stops and seizures, to how they were handling complaints. When someone complains, what do they do and how does internal affairs look at those? To uh, how they were doing with crisis intervention. And that's the idea of dealing with people who are in mental health crisis in a way that is not excessive. To how do you work with the community? 
Now, for the first two years that this consent decree was in place, the chief then didn't care. And I have to tell you that leadership matters. So nothing happened. The LA Police Department wasn't changing. And it wasn't until Bill Bratton came in, who was coming from New York City's police department, he came in and he took this consent decree seriously. And he started to push to make sure these changes happened. Now, it wasn't until 2009 that the first move was made to terminate this consent decree. And I want you to see the timing here. This is nine years of work on a police department until it is compliant with its consent decree. An enormous amount of time, but this is the hard work that has to be done. But the judge looked at that termination and said, we're not quite ready yet. Let's see how our community work is working here. How are, is our community doing everything that it needs to do? And so the community uh, effort was done and it wasn't until 2013, in fact, that the consent decree was completely terminated. So the question, the fair question to ask was, did it work? Well, I would argue that it absolutely did work. First of all, serious use of force dropped dramatically. And this is based on a study by Chris Stone and Christine Cole, who were working at Harvard uh, University at the time. They did the most exhaustive study of a consent decree that has ever been done. And an independent review of that. So they found that serious use of force fell. Now, one of the complaints that you continue to hear today is, well, if you look so closely at the police departments and you, and you put these prescriptive fixes on police departments, they're going to de-police, they're gonna stop policing. Well, in fact, they looked at LAPD and during the time of the consent decree, there was better policing. And so you have something called the hit rate. And the hit rate is, we see these law enforcement officers spread this very wide net, this incredibly wide net, and they just stop people. They stop people on the street, they stop people in cars, and most of the time those people have no contraband or never arrested. Well, those stops harm communities because people are affected when a police officer stops them, searches them, accuses them of wrongdoing when they haven't done anything wrong. Well, in fact, while this consent decree was in place, the people who the police stopped ended up being more likely to have contraband than what was happening beforehand. So better policing was happening. You had, in fact, crime going down at the same time. So the other thing is they say, well, crime's gonna go up if you look so closely at police departments. Well, the evidence is contrary to that. Crime goes down and public satisfaction in policing goes way up, even in the black and Latino communities, the most heavily uh, police communities. But this isn't perfect. And 10% of your black residents of LA, 10% of them said there isn't a single LAPD officer who treats them with respect. And that is of course a huge problem. So let's go to 2005, Hurricane Katrina. So remember, the New Orleans Police Department was allowed to fix itself. Well, did that happen? Well, Hurricane Katrina washed away the fallacy that a police department could in fact fix itself. It washed away. And the two photos you see are of an 18-year-old young man and a 40-year-old man with severe mental uh, disabilities. So the New Orleans Police Department, the Hurricane Katrina hits, the New Orleans Police Department, some members of it were on one bridge that was adjacent to the Danziger Bridge. And they claimed they heard gunfire near the Danziger Bridge. So after hearing what they thought was gunfire, they commandeered a rider truck, they drove over to the Danziger Bridge, they immediately when they got to the bridge, jumped out of that van and started shooting. Just started shooting. And they were shooting at two innocent families that were on that bridge. They shot and killed the 18 year old, and the 40 year old, as he was running away down to a local business where one of his family members worked, they shot him in the back and killed him. So not only was that conduct wrong, but on top of that conduct, what was wrong was the fact that they then tried to set up these families. They planted a gun, they planted witnesses, they falsified police reports, an entire cover up. And again, I will tell you, it's not just the fact that these officers shot and killed these people and shot and injured uh, other family members. It's the fact that other police officers on the department knew that their agency was corrupt and broken and needed fixing and did nothing about it. That's the harm of just blaming misconduct on a few bad apples. Nonetheless, the federal government came in and prosecuted these officers using 242. And originally they were sentenced to between 38 and 65 years when they were convicted. Uh, primarily by a uh, Department of Justice civil rights prosecutor by the name of Bobby Bernstein, an unbelievable prosecutor. Uh, she is uh, one of the best that the civil rights division has. Now, it turned out that the judge never really liked this case to begin with, never liked 
the way the Department of Justice was holding these officers uh, accountable for their actions. And it turned out that there was a, an AUSA who was uh, putting anonymous stories in the comment section of a local online newspaper. And despite the fact that there was no evidence whatsoever that this impacted the jury, this judge used that, used that fact to vacate the sentences. And when these officers were about to be retried, five of them pled guilty, and they went from the 38 to 65 uh, year sentences to seven to 12 year sentences after they pled guilty. Now, this time, we go to 2010, while this is all happening. And I want you to remember that timeline because it's, a, it's, it's noteworthy how long it took for those families to get justice. The shootings happened in 2005, the convictions didn't happen until 11 years later. But in 2010, the Department of Justice, under its pattern of practice authority, issued a findings letter. They had conducted, we had conducted, an enormous investigation of the New Orleans Police Department from top to bottom. Remember the five page findings letter in LA? We now have 158 pages spelling out what's wrong with the New Orleans Police Department. It covered an enormous amount of, uh, of stuff. It covered the fact that 20 out of 27 officer involved shootings in New Orleans over a period of time, all 27 victims were black men. It covered the fact that over a six year period, not a single, not a single officer involved shooting was found to be uh, against policy. It covered the fact that the New Orleans Police Department was routinely ignoring and dismissing complaints of sexual abuse by residents and visitors to New Orleans. And basically, New Orleans had a couple dozen sexual assaults, according to the official records, but we knew that there were many, many more. Not noted here is the fact that one of our attorneys was on the scene with a police officer when he heard a call for a, 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 a citizen's call, and the officer just ignored the call. And he turned to the officer and asked the officer, well, why are you ignoring that call? And the officer said, uh, well, because that's in the Latino neighborhood and I don't speak Spanish. Well, it turned out that our uh, our attorney spoke Spanish and asked the officer to go to the call. The officer went to the call. My, our attorney uh, served as a translator and learned that this woman was complaining of pretty vicious domestic abuse. But for the fact that one of our attorneys was on the ground, that woman would have never been able to file a complete in her case. So May 2010, the pattern and practice investigation is completed. Almost a year later, uh, sorry, it's open. Almost a year later, our findings letter is issued top to bottom, 158 pages. And then about uh, a year later, a consent decree is signed. And we went from 187 paragraphs to 490 paragraphs. And here is just some of the areas that that, that consent decree addressed. It said the policies have to be right and they have to be clear on everything from use of force to use of uh, deadly force to use of less than lethal weapons. It said that you had to conduct proper and independent use of force investigations. It talked about, again, how you deal with people in mental health crisis. It talked about data collection and data transparency. The fact that data does not belong to the police department, it belongs to the people and needs to be put out there. It talked about how to police bias free, not, ra not only race, but religion, but gender in every single way. It talked about the, the types of officers that were being recruited to the New Orleans Police Department. It talked about the fact that you talk about secondary employment or moonlighting. Police officers often work second jobs. In New Orleans, they were working these second jobs at like a CVS or a bank or, or a stadium, and they were requiring the people to pay them in cash. And that was just the way it was done in New Orleans. And we said that that violates the Constitution, that you cannot have officers, because when you do that, those officers are, pay, are, are, are doing more for their separately paid client than they are for the people of New Orleans. They talk about how you deal with misconduct applications. So again, a fair question is, is it working? Because New Orleans is still under that consent decree. So is it working? And I argue to you again that it is. Officer involved shootings fell from nine to zero. K-9 bites fell from 12 a year to zero. Vehicle pursuits, which are incredibly dangerous high-speed chases through a city, dropped dramatically. Sexual assault reporting, sadly, this is actually a number that we wanna see go up. And it went up dramatically during the time of this consent decree from 344 to over 1100. And at the same time, with a better complaint policy, the number of complaints against New Orleans police officer fell dramatically. 
And then most importantly, to many people, most importantly, is the fact that New Orleans had the lowest homicide rate, the lowest homicide rate that it had in almost 50 years. So consent decree, better policing, safer community, and it had been going down for the last three years while this consent decree is in place. So I would obviously say that it is definitely working. Now let's talk about a problem that we have in this country, and that is police-involved killings. We have basically created it as a normal that we are going to have about a thousand people killed by police each and every year. That's a problem. That's offensive. But we just allow that to happen year in and year out. The number, the percentages at the bottom of this chart, 26, 26, 28 percent, are the number of African Americans of those whose race are known that are killed by the police. African Americans represent only 13% of the United States. They are twice their population is likely to be killed by the police. That is a problem. So let's go to 2014. Again, we've been trying to talk about, maybe if we prosecute officers, other officers will change, and that's not working. And then we talk about, well, maybe if we do consent decrees and we work with police departments, maybe police departments will change. But, but the consent decrees you saw as a long, arduous process. And you would think that every police department, and there are about 18,000 police departments in this country, every police department would look at those consent decrees and say, are we doing those things? But they don't because they just say, well, that's a bad apple police department. And so in 2014, following the, the death of Michael Brown, President Obama set up a, a task force on 21st century policing. And that task force on 21st century policing was diverse in every single way, age, race, gender, occupation. This is Cedric Alexander, a police chief from Georgia. Lori Robinson, who used to be the head of the Office of Justice Program, the grant making component of the Department of Justice. Chuck Ramsey, who was a police chief in Philadelphia, Washington DC and a high level uh, officer in Chicago. Brittany Packnett from the Black Lives Matter movement. This is Chief Villasenor, who was a chief in Tucson, Arizona. Also on this uh, commission was, uh, on this task force was Tracy Mears, a professor at Yale University Law School. And Brian Stevenson, uh, obviously uh, of the Equal Justice Initiative and uh, of Just, Just Mercy. And they, under the leadership of Ron Davis, who was the head of the COPS office, they came up with six pillars. And I would argue to you that these six pillars are not astroscience. They're not, they're not rocket science. They're not astrophysics. They are basic common sense changes that one would expect to happen in any police department. So pillar one is talking about the idea that you need to have officers who are guardians of their communities, not warriors who are barreling into every situation, guns blazing. Pillar two talked about the importance of having proper and clear policies that everybody understands. Pillar three, among other things, it was about 60 different recommendations that fell into these pillars. Pillar three talked about how you use body cameras and the importance of having body camera footage. Pillar four talked about real community policing, not just having an officer show up at a community meeting every once in a while, but what does real community policing look like and community oversight look like? Pillar five talking about training, how to train officers to in fact do better. And pillar six, which is an important thing, talked about officer safety and wellness. Look, our police officers are just human beings. They have the same life issues that every single one of us has, whether it be marital or kids or financial. They need a place to de-stress, to have those uh, issues dealt with. And that is an important thing. We also see very high levels of suicide in policing. And so this task force talked about this. And this task force, its information was spreading around the country. We saw job ads for new chiefs that included a requirement that the police department hire a chief that was familiar with the task force on 21st century policing. We saw posts, police officer standards and training in every state that were following the task force recommendations. Again, just common sense recommendations on how to be accountable and how to treat your population right. And then 2017 came and a certain election came. As soon as Donald Trump was elected, the Fraternal Order of Police issued a wish list to the new, uh, the new president. That wish list is one of the most offensive documents that you can find, but helps to explain some of the problems that we are seeing in policing. So that wish list talked about uh, militarization of our local, state and local police departments, 
And we in, as in the Obama administration had limited that. And they said that needs to be rescinded. They actually had an opinion on DACA and the idea that kids who were born uh, in the United States to parents who were not United States citizens, that that should be rescinded. Thankfully, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that, that, that the DACA students should be able to stay. It talked about everything, the Muslim ban. It was an offensive document that the current administration has been basically kowtowing to since its first days. Included in that document, all of those, excuse me, all of those common sense recommendations from the task force on 21st century policing, it said all of those should be rescinded, that they don't belong there, that any kind of limitation, anything saying that police officers have to behave properly should be gone. And then possibly most offensive, most offensive for any police organization to be defending is the idea that racial profiling limitations, the ban on racial profiling that was put in place by the Bush administration should be removed. Why any police department would be against a ban on racial profiling is beyond me. But the Fraternal Order of Police is 300,000 officers, incredibly powerful organizations that we see around the country basically undermining, undermining the reform of police all over the place. And so then we have a president who tells a group of police officers in a speech in 2017 that they should remove their hands from the head of people they are arresting so that their heads can slam against the side of a car. So offensive was that statement that the local police department had to issue a statement saying that we do not and will not tolerate roughing up prisoners. Why a police department has to do that after a statement by a president of the United States is beyond me other than the fact that the president of the United States does not believe that law enforcement should be held accountable and that law enforcement should treat people properly. And then more recently, we saw that same president talk about when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Now, I don't think that this president had any sense of kind of the historical significance of this and what it meant with respect to the civil rights era, but it is offensive in that you are gonna take people who may be stealing stuff and you're gonna shoot and kill them on site. That is insane and that is improper. So where does that take us? Where does a complete reversal in all the efforts to reform policing take us? It takes us to this. A police officer in Minneapolis just casually kneeling on the neck of a black man who 20 times is saying he cannot breathe. And you have this officer and you have three officers just sitting there next to this officer doing absolutely nothing while for over eight minutes, this officer is snuffing out the life of this black man. That's what you get to when officers are not held accountable. This officer had 17 complaints against him, not one of them upheld, not one of them seriously upheld. Now, again, you hear all this nonsense about a few bad apples. Well, a lot of police misconduct investigations are hidden. No one sees them. No one knows what's happening. But in fact, when you do find them, tens of thousands of officers who have been investigated for misconduct, many of those officers are very serious misconduct. You have a, a project that Casey basically that recently came out from the Plain View Project, where they looked at the public social media postings of officers from six different police departments. And it, it contained the most vile, racist, sexist, violent language coming out of these officers' mouths. And why would any one of those people be police officers in our communities? They don't deserve it, they shouldn't be there, it's not just a few bad apples. We have an enormous number of sexual assaults by law enforcement officers. This is just a review of Google to find the arrests that are happening. And hundreds of officers over a three year period who were arrested for sexual abuse and sexual misconduct. You have just recently in Mount Vernon, New York, an officer who taped fellow officers talking about how they were framing innocent people. You have when these police officers, when these police departments have officers who are engaged in misconduct, you have people who have to be released from prison and jail who should have never been there in the first place because their convictions were based on the conduct and behavior of racist, sexist, criminal police officers. But their lives are ruined by the fact that they were arrested. 
and you have the head of a federal policing agency, the head of the U.S. Park Police currently, who has credible allegations of illegal search where he strip searched a black man on the side of the road and conducted a cavity search. And you have him with uh, serious allegations of committing perjury, yet he is the head of a federal law enforcement agency. So the question is, where do we go from here? Again, it's not just a few bad apples. Again, we know what we could have done to fix policing. And we also know that our current system just isn't working. So this right here is a chart that shows you how many murders and non-negligent manslaughter we have in this country. Tens of thousands each and every year, no matter how much money we dump into policing. Now, of course, I would rather have a number like 14,164 to a number like 17,294 murders, but all of these numbers are absurdly high. And if you look at the third row here, 4.5, 4.4, that's the rate per 100,000 of murders that we're having in this country. It really barely moves. I mean, these numbers may be statistically significant, but this isn't fixing violent crime. This isn't making our communities that much safer. And the numbers below that are the numbers on violent crime. And you can see that they barely move. Now, I don't trust these numbers very much because our data on, police, on law enforcement is awful. Our data on criminal justice is awful. But still, to be averaging around 370 per 100,000 violent crimes happening every year in this country says that our current system is not working. So this is where we go from there. The largest protest movement in the history of the United States that we are seeing spreading all over the world. Because we have a criminal justice system that is broken, we have officers that are not being held accountable, and we have people who are dying both from police violence, by police neglect, and by a system that doesn't work. And so we have the strongest rhetoric and everybody is seeing it now. And we have to change. And so with that, I thank you. And I will be around to answer questions at the end. Hi, folks. I am Frank Rudy Cooper. I think I'm supposed to start right away. But Ben, if I'm wrong, just intervene for a sec. <laughs> no, that's correct, Frank. Why don't you take it from here? We really appreciate okay, it. Well. That was a fantastic lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say, Professor Cooper. Thank you. So uh, first of all, I want to thank Roy for an outstanding presentation. I agree it was uh, eye-opening uh, and insightful and uh, just amazingly well delivered as well. So I appreciate the talk that he gave. I also want to thank the Academy for Justice for allowing me to respond to Mr. Austin and specifically to Ben, to Dawn, to Jennifer, to Suzanne, to Michael for helping put this together. So when I think about this, um, I agree a lot with what Roy had to say. And my main criticism, I can encapsulate in this phrase. <laughs> nice start, Mr. Obama. Now here's what Joe should do. And what I mean by that is the 21st Century Task Force on Policing really did give us a nice start to what we need to do about policing, but I think it can go further. And so uh, what I'm suggesting, obviously, is that there will be a president after Donald Trump uh, who will do something different than what Donald Trump has done that uh, Roy has documented for you about policing. So the first thing that I want to talk about with respect to Mr. Austin's presentation is that I absolutely agree with the duty to intervene that he has proposed. In all of those cases, it's not just that we see people uh, committing beatings and shootings and killings in other ways. It's also that in those cases, we see the 17 officers on the side of the um, Rodney King beating officers effectively cheering them on, at the least tacitly accepting their behavior. It's that when we see the George Floyd case, there are the three other officers besides the main miscreant who are pinning down George Floyd to help 
this murder. And the fourth officer, who had only been on the force for a short period of time, is running crowd control. People in the crowd are saying, stop that, let him up, he can't breathe. And that fourth officer is pushing them back onto the sidewalk, running interference for the murder. So I agree completely that we need a duty to intervene. And uh, I've written a Washington Post op-ed along with two other professors, Professor Suzanne Malvo of the University of Colorado Law School and Professor Catherine Smith of uh, the University of Denver Law School. And we made basically three points in that op-ed. So the first point was to look at the fact that the, you had the three sort of helpers and initially the helpers weren't charged at all and then the charges were moved up. And we talk in that op-ed about the fact that that is indeed aiding and abetting, right? To uh, go ahead and help pin down Floyd and to run crowd interference so that nobody else could intervene is aiding and abetting. So in that sense, there was already a crime that they could be charged with but it is exceedingly rare that police officers get charged by prosecutors. Prosecutors rely on police officers to bring them cases so that they can notch their victories. And they do not, as a matter of course, uh, as a sort of pattern and practice, if you will, they do not punish police officers. So that was our first point. Our second point was, there's something out there that could be helpful in terms of a duty to intervene. And that's the Klan Act of 1871. And that act, among other things, in section 1986, right, which is different from the section 1983 that a lot of people are very familiar with. 1983 is the constitutional tort for a civil rights violation. But section 1986 says that uh, state officials uh, have a duty to intervene and prevent civil rights violations that they know are going on or are about to go on. What it says is when police officers know uh, in, the 19, in the 1800s uh, context, right after the Civil War, when police officers knew that there was going to be a lynching, when police officers knew that the Klan was going to go and take somebody out of the Black neighborhood, they had a duty to intervene. And so we look at that section 1986 and we don't say, okay, just use section 1986. What we say instead is use that as a sort of analogy to create new state laws that would require officers to intervene. And what would that be? It would be an affirmative duty to act. Right, so police officers would have an affirmative duty to act if they had a reason to believe that there was uh, police misconduct of any sort, uh, but specifically use of force going on. So with that affirmative duty to act, they would not be able to stand by and watch as some of the officers in the Rodney King uh, beating did, or actually aid and abet as the officers in the George Floyd killing did. And, uh, I think two points to add to that. So that, and then our third point was just that that duty to intervene would help to break up the blue wall of silence. So the third point in that op-ed was, there's this blue wall of silence, police officers don't tell on each other. There are some reasons why there's this blue wall of silence, but it is toxic for a large uh, number of reasons to police culture. And to break it up, police officers have to ha believe that if they don't say something, their livelihood could be on the line. They could get fired. They could even pay damages, personal damages, uh, assuming they're not indemnified. So that's how you break up the blue wall of silence was our point, was to have an affirmative duty to act, this duty to intervene. And there are two sort of... Uh, add-ons to that that I think are important to note. We need a duty to intervene, but we also need anti-retaliation provisions because that blue wall of silence is real and it is enforced by violence and by people being left unprotected on the streets if they are seen as a snitch within the police department. So we need anti-retaliation provisions with this duty to intervene. And then in addition to that, 
perhaps most importantly, we need to get rid of qualified immunity because it is known that in these constitutional tort cases, Section 1983 cases, an individual can bring a suit for money damages against a police officer, but they have qualified immunity. That means that in order for the plaintiff to win, they have to prove two things. First, they have to prove there was actually a constitutional violation in the specific thing that the police officer did or didn't do. And because of the way the court has interpreted reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment, there's the big thumb on the scale saying that there won't be a finding of a constitutional violation. But even if the plaintiff jumps through that hoop, the second problem is that the qualified immunity means you have to show a constitutional violation and that that constitutional violation was, quote, clearly established, unquote, at the time of the violation. And that makes it harder because it in practice means that the plaintiff has to find that there was a case out there that said you couldn't do the specific thing they did. If, if they refused to give a diabetic uh, orange juice when they were told they should have given the diabetic orange juice so they wouldn't have an insulin reaction, you have to find a case that says something as specific as that out there to show that, that this police officer should have known that what they were doing was a constitutional violation. So you've got to prove a constitutional violation, and then you've also got to prove that that constitutional violation was clearly established at the time. So we need to get have an affirmative duty to intervene. We need to have anti-retaliation provisions. And then we need to also get rid of qualified immunity. So that's sort of what I've thought about in the past that I think is really important from Mr. Austin's presentation. I want to talk a little more directly about some of the things he said in the presentation by looking at the 21st Century Policing Task Force and its six pillars, which Mr. Austin went over. So there's the reason that I say, nice job, Obama, but here's what Joe should do, is because I have a problem with the very first pillar in the 21st century policing uh, task force. That pillar is about building trust and legitimacy. But the way they define legitimacy of the police is whether or not the police are being procedurally just. Now, procedural justice sounds nice, right? The police should be procedurally just. What does procedural justice mean? As a sort of definition in academia, what it means is that there have been studies that showed that people who uh, have been had something done to them by the law feel best when they feel they've been treated fairly, procedurally justly. So there's been a movement to in sort of instantiate that in policing, that police officers should be perceived as acting fairly towards people regardless of what they do to the person. So if you're given a speeding ticket, if you feel like, all right, the officer did indeed observe me speed, and the officer when they came up was respectful and requested my license and so forth, like in every ordinary case and didn't harass me in addition to what would normally be done in a ticketing case, speeding case, then I might feel, all right, they were procedurally just and I accept this penalty of I'm gonna have to pay $100 for speeding. That's all fine and good, but the key, which is shown in the task force language and in the definition of procedural justice, is that it's about appearances, right? So there is nothing inconsistent about saying a police officer has been procedurally just and saying, but they also racial profiled. So when it comes to the Wren pretext doctrine, which essentially says that police officers can racial profile as long as there was some picayune basis on which they could have made the seizure or, uh, or search of the person, that pretext doesn't matter. When it comes to the Wren pretext doctrine, procedural justice doesn't really do anything for us because it just says I have to feel well treated. It doesn't say I have to be well treated in the substantive sense that I should not be subject to racial profiling. And so uh, I think uh, time-wise, I'm gonna 
wrap up this point uh, and then just make a general observation about the rest of the procedural, uh, about the 21st century task force pillars. So as to this procedural justice pillar, I think what we need to do is say, it's not enough to appear fair, you have to substantively be fair. And what would that mean in terms of the reforms that people are calling for now as part of the Black Lives Matter movement and that state legislatures are now taking up? It would mean that states put into their law that reasonableness factors in the reason, the motivation for the police officer's activity. The Wren pretext doctrine says, we don't look at the motivation. As long as it is true that you stop too long at a stop sign, then it doesn't matter that the real reason the police stopped you was because you were a black person driving a nice car and they figured you were a drug dealer and wanted to do a drug search that they wouldn't have been allowed to do. It doesn't matter because they can say, well, we stopped you for stopping too long at a stop sign or for going too fast as under their interpretation of what's too fast in a residential neighborhood. Not just did you break the speed, but did they think it was unreasonable? All these little picayune things can be the basis for the stop. And so I think we have to say that's not reasonable. We have to have a broader interpretation of reasonableness that takes into account what was the real reason the police officer did this. Sometimes we won't be able to tell why the police officer did it, and in those cases, we'll be at the status quo. But in cases like Wren itself, where there was good reason to believe that the stop was really just racial profiling, then the courts, here local courts, would have to take into account why the officer did what they did and could find that the racial profiling made the stop unreasonable, which of course means the evidence, if there was any evidence, would be thrown out. So uh, I have said, absolutely, duty to intervene, go for it. I have said we have to add to that duty to intervene, anti-retaliation, and the end of qualified immunity. And I've said that we need to not use procedural justice as our basis of legitimacy in the first pillar of the 21st century task force because it is not inconsistent with bad behavior. So I appreciated Mr. Austin's presentation. Uh, I find much of it compelling and I would encourage him uh, to look beyond just those six pillars in the 21st century task for, uh, report because I do think that some of them are not inconsistent with the behavior that he is rightly, rightfully complaining about in the Trump era. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cooper. Um, Mr. Austin, I'll ask you to join us again here as well, and we can get to some audience questions. Uh, I've had them rolling in as we're going, so I'll do my best to get to everyone's questions. I may have to paraphrase a few of them um, or lump a couple together. And if you don't get your question answered, we'll see what we can do about making sure that you get an email response from some of us. Uh, so the first thing, let's, let's jump in with something that Professor Cooper said that also relates to uh, Roy's presentation, which is about police bystanders and the duty to intervene. And so the question is that from Rodney King to George Floyd, there are innumerable examples of police bystanders ignoring obvious brutality. Uh, you both spoke about the possibility of an affirmative duty on officers to intervene. Uh, Professor Cooper seems to be very much in favor of it, but how should such a law be formulated and what should the penalties look like? For example, are they criminal or civil? Okay, so I'll defer to you, uh, Mr. Austin, if you wanna talk first. Oh, well, Frank, you've never called me Mr. Austin before, so let's go with Roy. And, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and let me get to the question, but let me, let me just start with, um, I, I think I'm owed a rebuttal to Frank's piece. Um, and so I, I, let me, my rebuttal will be a quick one. I agree. I, okay. I, I agree with what Frank, uh, has just said and, and argued. I, I, but I want people to understand what we were facing as the Obama administration, which is a completely new world. The world of criminal justice reform since the murder of George Floyd is 180 degrees different from the world that we were seeing before that. There were, if you remember, President Obama made a statement that a police officer acted stupidly in his arrest of Professor Gates on Harvard's campus. President Obama was one 
100% correct that that officer acted stupidly. The blowback to that was so enormous that he had the police union going out there saying that President Obama was uh, engaged in a jihad against police officers, that we were on a war against the police based on him looking at that one situation of a, of a professor trying to get into his own home and being arrested by the police. It is a completely different world right now where we have people willing to look at police union contracts, to look at police, and to not just give them the benefit of the doubt over and over again. That's what the Supreme Court did in Wren. It just basically said, oh, police officers, for the most part, do the right thing. Yeah. I would say that for the most part, police officers do whatever they want to do, and, and a, a significant amount of the time, if not maybe most of the time, if you look at hit rates, the number of times they actually find contracts, most of the time they do the wrong thing. Most of the time, they're just out there guessing. And most of the time that impacts are black and brown and native people uh, and people with disabilities more than anyone else. So I just wanna start with saying that uh, I think Frank is 100% right. We hope that in the, under a Biden administration that we move beyond what were the re recommendations of the task force of 21st century policing. But I would tell, say one thing to police officers who may hear this or may listen to this, they had a chance to fix it. They didn't have to be hearing the terms of defund the police and things like that. They're hearing that because they've refused to do so, because they've undermined opportunities at reform every time they've come forward. And so now we are at the other side of this, where people are actually talking about, let's get rid of police. So sorry for the very long rebuttal. Um, and to answer the question directly, I think first and foremost, if a police officer sees another police officer engaged in misconduct and does nothing about it, they should no longer be a police officer. It should be termination, period because they aren't there to protect and serve their public. They're there to protect and serve fellow police officers. Now, whether or not it rises to the level of, 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 a, of a criminal violation, I think is a, a question to how much they've either urged on that officer or they've engaged in some kind of obstructive conduct. But look, I'm also coming from the criminal justice reform movement where we have over criminalized too many things, where we are talking about locking people up and destroying their lives in another way. And I think it's important that I be consistent in my beliefs on criminal justice reform. And that means a feeling that we don't need to criminalize every piece of conduct. But I would say administratively, they have forfeited their right to be a police officer. Well, I and I agree with Roy, obviously, about the duty to intervene. I appreciate his uh, rebuttal, which, uh, you know, is somewhat of an agreement. So I'm glad to, to hear that. Um, in terms, Ben, of what the law should look like, I think the Colorado model is a pretty good model. There's a California model for some sort of implied duty to intervene. But what we really need is a clear law that says that in this state, there is an affirmative duty for a police officer to in intervene in. And then I think the language needs to be something along the lines of police misconduct or civil rights violations by fellow officers. And um, and then in Colorado, they do have an anti-retaliation provision, which I think is really important. And they did get rid of qualified immunity under state law. So I like the Colorado law as a model for what this might look like. Um, and I'm going to be proposing in Nevada that we do something like that here. And I appreciate that. Uh Roy actually anticipated my coda that I wanted to add on to this, which is whether there's a tension between prosecuting police officers and sort of the broader decarceration or abolition movement that a lot of us are involved in. Uh, I know your stance on that now, Roy. Frank, uh, what are your thoughts on prosecuting errant police officers versus something like civil damages? Yeah, so I think it is complicated uh, for the reasons that you've both sort of suggested. Um, we don't want to be hypocritical. I think the police have a tough job and they should be paid well, but I do believe that it's not inconsistent to prosecute them for egregious violations, even criminally, because it's maybe precisely because we are putting such a public trust in them. So I think it's okay to criminally prosecute uh, police officers for bad actions to show that we believe in the public trust um, to I wouldn't overreach to do it. I do feel that if there were a civil liability avenue, then a lot, then prosecutions could be left alone, right? We could say, you know, you were stamped with, you know, or st uh, not stamped with, you were uh, hit with this um, civil liability, that's enough. 
right? You're going to lose your job. That's enough. We don't have to criminally prosecute you. Just as, you know, if any of us as citizens who I'm presuming don't have any substantial record, right? If we were being prosecuted for something, a lot of times a good prosecutor would take into account, all right, you've suffered some harm and it's enough harm. Well, since we're on the topic of individual officer accountability, I wanna go down uh, a question about bad faith. Right? So uh, Mr. Austin, you mentioned the Danziger Bridge shootings, the investigation into cover-ups by the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, Professor Cooper, right, you mentioned the blue wall of silence that we're all sort of familiar with as a concept. Uh, so one of the questions reads that the root of the problem is that good cops are covering up the actions of bad cops, either willingly or through coercion. And so how do we stop false narratives, cover-ups, and corruption of police misconduct? Essentially, how do we get to uh, investigate misconduct if everyone is sort of protecting each other? Yeah. Is uh, just just to start, I mean, first of all, you have to investigate misconduct. I mean, right now we, we don't investigate it, or it is it is uh, very lightly investigated. Mm -hmm. And so we first have to make sure that the internal affairs unit or whoever the independent investigating uh, component is, has a real ability to conduct an investigation. And, and, and some of that may be to move a lot of the investigation to civilian oversight and give civilian oversight the opportunity to uh, subpoena documents, to get any documents it needs and to institute discipline where necessary, because uh, it is clear we have seen over and over again that police departments don't themselves do so. Uh, the other thing is to, look, police officers, if you pull a police officer to the side and you say, hey, is there a problem officer in, in, your, uh, in your police department? They will tell you about all the problem officers. They know who the bad apples are, but there is no space for them to say anything because they will be destroyed by their police union. They'll be destroyed by their fellow officers. They will not be protected. We've seen officers, uh, black officers, who have been killed um, in part because they have no cover, because other officers don't like them, because they've been willing to report misconduct. So we have to create that space for an officer to actually report bad conduct. And uh, there's a, a system called EPIC in uh, New Orleans that is showing some great progress. There's a program called ABLE, uh, another program that is showing great promise in, in this kind of ability for officers to, to say when fellow officers are acting for them. Okay. And um, I largely agree. What I would say is I like civilian oversight. It should have subpoena power, but I think it should be the backstop that we really need to change the culture within the police department itself. So what I'd like to see is um, not necessarily that the Civilian Oversight Board can itself institute the punishment, but instead that we change the culture enough with anti-retaliation laws and so forth that um, it doesn't have to get to that, right? That internal affairs actually does its job and that police officers are willing to say who the bad officers are and not cover for them because I, I have, you know, sympathy for the fact that as a police officer, it's like when we have the one professor who, you know, is inappropriate with students, right? You're thinking to yourself, oh, great. Now it looks like all professors do this, where it's like something that happened 10 years ago. Let's make it that type of situation where police officers can protect their own reputation by stepping up. But they need some help to do that. And it might be a hammer like the oversight board, or it might be more of a carrot like will protect you if you do it through anti-retaliation or, and I don't know about the EPIC program, but it sounds like there are some other ways to induce police officers to speak up about bad officers. But uh, Ben, I do want to just add, in Frank pointing out a professor, I, I, I want to make it clear, police officers are just like all the rest of us. When, when, when you know a fellow professor is, is acting in, inappropriately, there are very few people who will step in to, to tell somebody of authority that that professor is acting inappropriately. Everybody just kind of hides their eyes. Mm -hmm. That happens in every profession. Mm -hmm. We all know those people who are like, that's inappropriate. We don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem isn't that, um, that police are somehow different. It's that we've given police the power to be even more different and to act upon these things in ways that they shouldn't be able to. So it's kind of human nature in whatever setting we are, we're in. Shoot, it's in our families. We see people in our families who are like, hmm, that person is, is a little off. And we don't do anything about it. And so it's just, how do we create something that gives room for police because they have so much power to behave better? Uh, that's what I think we need to create. 
Right. And that's where the culture comes in. Sorry, Ben. That's where the culture comes in is what I would say is that in, in law faculties now, um, when I came in 20 years ago, what I heard was, you know, it, and you're old. all this nonsense that went on and it's not going to happen anymore. Right. And so I came in and the culture was that would be totally unacceptable. You know, nobody should be supporting anybody who does that. And that's been my experience in the 20 years in the profession, although I understand that it wasn't always the case. And so we need to get to that, you know, new officer comes on and they're told, no, we don't just let people beat people up or, you know, work with drug dealers to get payoff or whatever. We don't do that here. Well, I'm going to segue then from the question of changing culture to the question of qualified immunity, because I see a tie in there. Uh, I was actually on a podcast earlier this week with two police chiefs, uh, Chief Jerry Williams from the Phoenix PD and Chief Renee Hall of Dallas PD. And both of them are committed to improving the culture, committed to improving policing, reducing the use of violence. Uh, and one of the things that they mentioned that I thought was fascinating is that they are hesitant to completely dismantle qualified immunity because they view it as protecting them when they are terminating officers and attempting to change culture. Uh, and so I'd be curious, uh, Frank, you in particular were clear about your stance against qualified immunity. Uh, what about the argument that it insulates officers who are trying to change the culture from you know, wrongful termination suits or other kinds of misconduct suits um, and retaliation against them? Yeah, so I'm thinking that in most cases that's not gonna be relevant because it's gonna be a sort of due process violation that they're trying to make as a, a, a constitutional tort. Um, the good news is due process violations are rarely, uh, you, you don't win those in this type of due process violation for firing somebody. So they're probably as protected as they need to be um, with that. Um, so I guess what I would say is they don't really need qualified immunity for the superiors. They do sometimes have problems with the LIBORs, the sort of law enforcement bill of rights. I'm a big fan of unions. They should protect themselves but police unions have become so powerful that they get protections that, you know, prevent, that's what really pre prevents a chief from doing anything is they have to give 10 days notice and they have, you know, they can't talk to the officer directly and, you know, they have to do all sorts of things that make it pr practically impossible to prosecute, to uh, internally investigate and catch the person. Yeah, and I just, you know, I just want to say we, we have to be careful. I, like, I, I agree. The qualified immunity as it stands right now is, is crazy. Um, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But if you give Americans a chance to litigate things, they're going to litigate things, no matter which direction it comes from. And our civil courts are, uh, are overflowing with lawsuits. Everyone wants to bring a lawsuit about any, everything. And we now have a situation where we have a number of people who have been made judges who are not particularly qualified to be judges. So I, I don't think qualified immunity fixed, I, I think it needs to be fixed, but I don't know that it's the, the real resolution. And it also, I mean, civil litigation takes years, if not decades um, to get to a resolution. So yes, it needs to be fixed, but I, I'm not sure that just completely undoing qualified immunity is the answer to that question, because look, the unions will rightfully go against a chief that's bad, but they will also go against chiefs that are good. Um, and, and, and people will go against officers who were bad, but they'll also go against officers who were good just to get back at that officer. And so we just have to be careful about further tying up any of our systems in the court system, which is um, really just overflowing with kind of a lot of nonsense um, and a lot of bad decisions and um, a lot of wasted time. Let's move from individual accountability for a second to sort of broader structural changes. Um, and so Roy, your presentation focused a lot on consent decrees and their potential. I've got a couple of questions related to that. Uh, the most interesting that came in was, uh, doesn't the enforcement of consent decrees simply pump millions of taxpaying dollars back into the police, sometimes with only incremental or negligible results? And what would you think about completely dismantling existing structures and diverting some of that money towards schools, boys and girls clubs, mental health services, et cetera, rather than just more training, more data analysis, more body cameras, whatever. So this sounds like someone who is, uh, who, who just didn't want to use the term defund the police, because that's exactly what uh, this question is, is asking. And um, 
look, I think part of my presentation is talking about the fact that what we currently do, no matter how much money we keep pumping into law enforcement, just isn't working. We are a ridiculously violent society here in the United States. Um, we keep pouring money into law enforcement as though that's going to fix the problem. We keep giving longer prison sentences, so that's going to fix the problem. And over generations now, you know, we've seen crime drop, but still not drop to where it should be. So I am a thousand percent in favor of the idea of putting more money into social services, into our schools, into our healthcare system, into our education system, uh, into all of these other things than just pouring it into consent decrees. But I also realized what just happened in Chicago this past week and what happened in Baltimore and what's happened in many of our, of our cities. And that is that there is a level of violence there that we have to do something about. And it's not enough to just completely dismantle the, the, the police department because we don't have something yet that fixes that, that's something that replaces that. So I think we need to move, have a dramatic shift in money, but there, look, I live in a community where I actually want to be able to call the police if something is happening in my home. And I have to be honest about that. And again, not be hypocritical about it. And I want the police to be able to protect me and my kids. I don't know. I don't want them stopping my young son and abusing him. But I want them, if he's ever in trouble, or if my daughter's ever in trouble, or my wife's ever in trouble, or I'm ever in trouble, I want to be able to call an honest police officer to provide safety. And I don't think those things um, don't work together. But I don't think it's a matter of completely dismantling, because we are a society where people will kill each other, where people will rape each other, where people will rob each other. And we need to have something that protects and prevents that from happening. And we need to figure out what that is. Yeah, and I like the idea of shifting um, not necessarily getting all the way to abolition, but I was surprised that there are police officers, I've been on a panel with a police officer who said, yes, take the mental health stuff away from us, right? That they're like, we're not mental health professionals. And that creates a lot of problems. Yes, sometimes somebody's committing a crime, but they're committing it because they have, they're off their meds, right? They, they can't get any psychological services, um, here they like to talk about the fact that the largest mental health provider is the local jail, right? So um, that's, they might actually agree to some of the services being taken off their hands when it means that they don't have to be experts in mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, and how do you, you know, de-escalate a domestic dispute. But let me just add, there are a ton of social workers out there who have zero interest in walking into a situation where you have someone who is violent with a knife, with a gun, even if your gut is that this person is not going to use it, a bunch of social workers don't necessarily want to be the ones to be the, the first responders in that situation. They want to be there to help, but they also need protection. A number of your teachers don't want to necessarily be the ones who have to intervene when you have two people in your school fighting each other and maybe fighting each other with weapons. And so we, we, we need to figure out, and it, there, there's, there's a nuance to this, there's a line to this where we have to shift resources, we have to do something different than what we're doing right now. But your average social worker, as much as they care about the community, does not want to be the one to step up to somebody who is waving a gun around to say, hey, can you put the gun down, please, and, and, and stop behaving the way you are? Because it's, they want to go home at the end of the day as well. Staying on the subject of consent decrees for a second, uh, and I'm actually particularly thinking about this in the context of uh, sort of how Frank titled his response, uh, right, which is that's a good start. Uh, here's what Joe can do next. Right? Ultimately, consent decrees require uh, the Department of Justice and the executive branch more generally to support police reform. And over the last three years, we've seen DOJ roll back some of their consent decree authority, imposing sunset dates, requiring political sign off, et cetera. Uh, what, if anything, can we do when we have an executive branch like this one that uh, seems to prefer the few bad apples narrative or that seems to be resistant to the idea of federal government intervening in fixing uh, police departments? It, it can't always be waiting for the next administration, can it? Well, first and foremost, we have to vote them out because they're a joke. But uh, that's getting very political here, and I guess I'm, I should probably behave myself. Um, but. Um, and, and this same Department of Justice, I want to note, just issued a findings letter on the Springfield, Massachusetts drug unit, finding that they were acting in unconstitutionally. So there's a recognition by this same Department of Justice that we have whole police units, whole police departments that act in this way and, and act improperly. So uh, 
I think the problem is, is that in, in the Department of Justice, we opened 25 investigations, which was a record during the Obama administration. Again, we have 18,000 police departments. So we have to provide incentives somewhere else for fixing it. So we have to give each and every state attorneys general the ability to investigate their state law enforcement agencies. We have to, uh, again, put it, the power in the hands of the people through civilian review to make sure that they have the ability to investigate their police departments and that the civilians who are being policed have a say in how they're being policed and have a say in what uh, the police should be doing. So it, it's gotta be something different than just everything being at the federal level, uh, especially when we have an election where we could have someone who will try to dismantle it. And, and especially because the reason why New Orleans is working right now is because we have a federal judge who cares deeply about these issues and is doing something about it. That's what happened in Detroit. A federal judge who cared incredibly deeply about trying to fix the Detroit Police Department. But again, I don't trust the judges who have recently been put in place. I don't trust that they're going to look at this in the right way. So no, I don't think consent decrees are the only answer or necessarily always the best answer, but it's the answer we've had until now. But again, we are in a post-George Floyd world where I think we can look for solutions that are bigger and stronger and coming from elsewhere. Yeah, and I would just say that this is part of the reason why we probably, uh, Roy and I have a little bit of a disagreement about civil suits. I think that letting people be private attorneys general is one of the ways that we regulate the police. Should state attorneys general have an opportunity to do pattern and practice? Sure, I agree with that as well. But you know, we need a whole package, and I think the package needs to include that I, with my incentive, having had my rights violated, you know, pursue it even through the course of years in order to sort of send a message to the local police department. So I want to focus now on sort of a trend that I'm seeing in a lot of the questions, which is a, a general sense of either hopelessness or uncertainty about how we can get involved. Um, and so this is the question that comes to mind, especially since we've just been talking about uh, judges as well as, as playing a role in enforcing uh, police department reform. Uh, so somebody writes in to say, I've been listening to the audiobook, The New Jim Crow, and if, as author Michelle Alexander describes, the Supreme Court has consistently allowed police and legislatures to shrink personal liberties, Fourth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, discrimination in jury selection, and so on, and if Congress shows no interest in revising draconian criminal justice laws, what avenues can we pursue to fix things? Tough one. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, and I'm, this is an interesting question to me because I think that there's this is a trend in a lot of the questions that we're getting, which is simply uh, much of criminal justice reform seems to be proposing things that can be changed, but how do we implement the change, right? What do we actually do to make sure that the things we want to see happen and how much of that relies on other institutional actors agreeing with us and taking the initiative versus what we can do as citizens? So I guess what I would start off by saying is this is why judges are so important. Um, and if those who care about these issues have to pay attention to a lot of different players at once, right? So they have to pay attention to the courts at the federal level, but also at the state level. They have to pay attention to their state attorney general and you know their state legislators, as well as at the federal level. Um, so I don't have an answer for how we do that. I think what I have is uh, just a reminder that we've got, you know, multiple branches of government and we've got to pay attention to all of them at once. Look, I, I, I think that, and, and I, don't, I don't have an answer either. We live in a democracy and, and our democracy has, has had uh, numerous troubling and troubled moments, including the current presidency. The, um, the issue is, is that criminal justice is largely a state and local issue. And each individual has even more power to make change in the state in, in, in their state or their locality. We need to have these reform-minded prosecutors lifted up. There are only right now a couple dozen of them, but they are prosecutors who have largely made it clear that they're going to hold law enforcement accountable for misbehavior. I mean, we have a criminal justice, justice system that has 2.2 million people who are currently incarcerated. Only the 0.2 is federal. The 2 million is, is what's happening on our, on our state and local levels. We need to, them to make sure that their mayors know who they want as their police chiefs. We want to make sure that the city councils know what kind of rules and laws they want in place. And these are things that the individual has more power over. So I would start with vote, vote locally, mm -hmm. and 
this protest movement has mattered and people taking to the street and, and police officers showing themselves to be who they are. When they start beating and abusing completely innocent, peaceful, but loud, peaceful protesters, they're showing you exactly who they are and what they've gotten away with. And when they, when they start doing this to the uh, white suburban kids of Washington, DC, they are feeling it. And that's something that, that Brian Stevenson talks about a lot, is the idea of, of it being personal and feeling it. And these communities are right now feeling the abuse of police departments in a way that they've never felt it before. So as long as we live in a democracy, as long as we can vote in and vote out and we can protest, and that's what we have to continue doing and to make real change. But no, we can't sit there trusting our Supreme Court to get this right. The Supreme Court has gotten it wrong for generations. For centuries, they've gotten it wrong. Um, I mean, obviously, like Plessy stands out and, and, and you know, over and over again, Wren stands out as a, it's just an, an ignorant decision. What they've done on qualified immunity is a, is a horrible decision. But we can't just rely on them. The people rule. And at the local level, we can vote and we can make change happen much faster than we can on the federal level. So on the local question then, um, one of the questions we have is what sorts of resources do our communities or our various police departments have to build a working relationship between communities and law enforcement? How can people get involved? What sorts of opportunities are there? I'll start. So um, on, first of all, I think these police oversight commissions are a good way to get involved. The one thing I what was going to mention earlier, though, is that they are often captured in, a, in various ways. And so one of the things that people have to do, one of the many things they have to pay attention to is like, you hear there's a police oversight board and you care about these issues, apply for the police oversight board. Um, but the resources for police and communities working together, I think starts with going to, and this is the 21st Century Task Force said, go to the communities that are most affected by policing, right? They may or may not actually be the most high crime areas, right? They may, there may not, you know, maybe when it comes to like drugs, you could go to the local college campus and find as many, you know, drug dealers and drug users as you could in certain communities, but certain communities are the ones where the police go to, and that's where they have to rebuild the relationship. So they have to sort of start there. The idea in the task force of non-enforcement based activities is one of the ways that there's a, an ability for the police to show they don't just come in when you know, something goes wrong when there's violence in the community and crack heads, they're also there on a Saturday doing, you know, it's, it gets overborne, but you know, the police basketball league is not a bad idea if they want to be seen as part of the community and not just overseers. Right. Get that. I don't have, I don't have anything to add to Frank. <laughs> I think he, he, he said it perfect. Excellent. Uh, so the next question is actually about, uh, individual choices and, and individual involvement with police. And it touches on something that Roy said. Uh, so Roy, you said that you, you know, you want to be able to call the police when something goes wrong in your neighborhood. Uh, and so this person writes in and says, I'm afraid sometimes to call the police. Um, I'm fearful that the situation will escalate and that it'll cause more harm than good. Uh, sometimes I think it's better to let things go than to gamble and take the risk of reaching out to law enforcement, which brings additional elements into the picture. So when is it appropriate to call the police and what can we as community members do to help control the situation so that matters don't escalate? You know, and, and this is the problem that we're seeing right now. So, you know, when I, when I showed the homicide numbers, I mean, something that's important to note is that the clearance rate for homicides in this country is around 60%, which means no one is arrested. It doesn't even mean someone's convicted, which means no one is arrested for about 40% of the homicides that happen here. We know based on the data from the National Crime Victimization Survey that the police actually show up for a very, very tiny number of crimes that occur. Very serious crimes, robberies. People just won't report it. Rapes, lots of people don't report these things. And so the, the question that, uh, that, the, that the person who asked that question is, is pointing out is a huge problem with policing right now and is part of why our system right now is not doing the job it's supposed to be do, is it's supposed to do, is that people do not trust the police. Too many people, and, and especially in communities where police have been very heavy handed. And the police should understand that they have to do better. 
if they're going to want to actually do more on the crimes that are really important and stop harassing people. I, I, two current, two, two very recent situations, a young lady, black woman driving on the GW Parkway, stopped by the police for driving 55 and a 50 and supposedly going too slowly. The police officer with his hand on his gun sits there screaming and yelling at her. That woman is never going to go to the police if something else happens because of that experience. And this is a well-off young woman. Another black woman sitting in her car with her black boyfriend in a white neighborhood, police show up, order them out of the car at gunpoint, search that car. Because someone using some app said there's some suspicious people outside and they just happen to live in that community. Those two people are never going back to the police department. The police have created this environment where people do not trust them. And the onus is on them to change their behavior so that people will in fact trust them. Yeah, and it's interesting in terms of when to call the police. The answer is, unfortunately, usually you shouldn't. Um, and I've seen an interesting chart where it sort of says, you know, it's a flow chart, right? Should you, you know, something bad has happened. Should you call the police? And the first answer is, well, you know, is it a crime of high violence? If not, don't call the police, right? Is it, you know, a crime, if it's not of, uh, if it's of high violence, is it something that could be, that might be de-escalating on its own anyways? Okay, then don't call the police. If it's not de-escalating, you know, is there a friend of that person you can call or a non-police officer you can call? Okay, don't call the police. And it's unfortunate that that's how a lot of people are now thinking for the reasons, you know, examples that Roy gave are perfect for that. One other example I would give in, when it comes to like rape and uh, sexual assault is Aya Gruber at Colorado talks about the feminist war on crime. And one of the things that happened was there was a confluence that started in the 1970s where women said, we want rapes and sexual assaults to be prosecuted. And they didn't think about the fact that they were contributing to hyper-incarceration just by, you know, at the sort of level of ideology and of support for the idea that like you every any, if there's a problem you you bring in the police right and and that helped contribute to hyper incarceration and she's arguing now that feminists need to pull back from that idea that, that you know the first thing is make the police arrest everybody maybe that's not always the best solution to call the police or to have them arrest everybody so we've got one more minute now, so I'm just going to leave it open for last concluding thoughts. Um, Roy, why don't we start with you, and then Frank, if you have something else you want to add. I just want to say thank you, Ben, um, and ASU for allowing us to have this discussion, and, and huge thank you to Don and Jennifer and Suzanne and Michael for, for their help in putting this together. This is an incredibly important conversation. Our public safety is one of the most important things that we have, and all I can say is we, we, we have to put the right people into office and the right people into power. And, and in a democracy, the way to do that is to vote and to protest. And I hope that we do both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Frank. I also thank you so much, Ben, and, and the Academy. Um, what I would end with is saying, when it comes to the law, there should be, there shall be no unreasonable searches or seizures. And I would attack the Supreme Court there by having Congress redefine reasonableness because the court has said in the past that it defers to congressional definitions of reasonableness. So if Congress were to redefine reasonableness and say racial profiling affects whether something is reasonable, the court might defer to that. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you to the, you know, several hundred people who have tuned in live, hopefully everyone who gets to see this pre-recorded, um, who wasn't able to be here today. It's been a fantastic conversation. It's obviously a much needed one and a very timely. Um, I hope we get to do this again soon. Um, so with that, thank you to everyone. 